Okay, so um, good morning and thank you for coming to uh, taking your time to uh, come and see us today. My name is Rod Soto and I am here with uh, Victor Fan from Ray and Chain. I'm a security researcher. Um, I co founded uh, Hack Miami and the Pacific Hackers in the West Coast. Uh, some of the companies I work for um, Akamai, uh, Canon, Toshiba. Uh, Splunk, and uh, one that is uh, quite related to the crypto scene, Prolexic. I was actually part of the team that protected Mount Gough. Remember Mount Gough? They were a pain in the ass. Uh, if you actually go on Twitter, you see how they would tweet like, we're down because of Prolexic. Like, <laughs> they, they weren't an easy client, and we don't know what happened afterwards. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, I come from the, the crypto, like, uh, 2009, 2010. We were actually buying whoppers for 20 Bitcoins. Uh, so um, what we're going to talk today is about uh, smart security, uh, smart contract uh, security. And uh, I'm just going to go quick on an uh, introduction on, on some of the blockchain security aspects, uh, which obviously this is this, what this is, villages. This is it's an effort to bring... Uh, security into the blockchain um, scene, and uh, um, it's a good effort. Do you want to? Yeah, no, yeah. Just a quick intro of myself. Right? I'm Victor Fang, so I used to work. To at, to yeah, I used to work at uh, Fire Mendian, and uh, the company I founded last year. Oh, who's from Mendian? Yeah. Oh, cool. Hey, we should talk. Okay. And by the way, that's my face. <laughs> Does you realize? And uh, so we uh, we graduated from the uh, UC Berkeley. Um, the blockchain accelerator, and uh, yeah, it's very proud to be here presenting, sharing some of our, our research. All right, so we're, we're a little short, so I may go a little fast on this. Uh, some background on the blockchain, uh, basically uh, implemented around, effectively implemented around 2008, um, believed to be immutable, public ledger. It's like a DV technology that you can check, it's exposed, it's public. Um, Fault tolerant for the most part. It has been popularized by cryptocurrencies. Uh, there are some, some interesting implementations right now on financial video games, uh, web video content, social media, uh, and some countries are actually doing an agriculture. Uh, the most successful uh, of all the cryptocurrencies, and uh, you can check it right now, is obviously VTC. Uh, it, was, uh, it was close to 12,000 yesterday. Um, and according to John McAfee, we hit 500,000. I hope he's right, at least on that, right? So <laughs> I know John, by the way. Um, um, the, uh, obviously, we have um, a development of blockchain uh, um, frameworks. Uh, and uh, I would say the, most sec the, second, the second most popular is uh, Ethereum. And it's, uh, it's highly traded. And with Ethereum, uh, the concept of a smart contract uh, was introduced. So um, what is a smart contract? A smart contract is basically a framework that facilitates negotiation without the need of third parties. So what this does is um, um, aims to reduce uh, transaction costs and enforces the contract uh, under the blockchain framework. Uh, the transactions are trackable and uh, irreversible, and I put that in quotation marks because we're gonna see some sort of an example of how this irreversible, sort of like a flexible term, uh, has been implemented in several uh, cryptocurrencies, including blockchain and Ethereum. Uh, the, the most popular uh, standard right now is ERC-20. So um, at one point you saw a bunch of people selling you uh, the framework to create a new cryptocurrency. Basically what they did is the, they copy the Ethereum uh, uh, blockchain, um, use ERC-20, and then they'll sell it to you for $250,000. So you just had to name a new currency. Um, as we all know, at this point, smart contracts can be exploited. So we had DAO, that was a 3.6 million of, it, of either. Um, and the amount of losses was so huge that it was basically easier to hard fork that continue with that. So that's an example how smart contracts can be hacked. And today you're gonna to see actual examples of how that happens and how to, uh, to audit the smart contracts. Um, they are a powerful tool, uh, and in my opinion, 
the with with the, the smart contract is the bridge that can enable blockchain to widespread in many other uh, areas. We don't have to. Uh, I, I think it's it's important to see blockchain. It's just not only crypto. Crypto has driven it, but there are other uh, areas that we can definitely implement this. And uh, it doesn't have to uh, scare the banks and the powers that be, uh, which is usually, in my opinion, why crypto has been held back. And I'm on other uh, reasons. But, but basically, uh, things such as uh, the smart contracts and uh, um, several new standards um, will help to, to advance the cost of implementing blockchain technologies. Uh, and uh, uh, we can use uh, smart contracts for, like I said before, we can use it for records, supply chain, digital identities, mortgage, insurance. So here's the one of the main problems of, of the blockchain scene, right? So which is the hacking history. It's just plagued with fraud, fraudsters, and uh, people that, uh, for some reason, uh, can explain mysterious hacks. Uh, so we have some of the relevant hacks here. The Mt. Gox one. Uh, again, I had experience with Mt. Gox because uh, we protected Mt. Gox. And Mt. Gox was, was basically a trading site for cards. And then they turn it into a cryptocurrency exchange. And they will get hit all the time with DDoS. All the time. So we, uh, in case you wonder if we knew how the Bitcoins were lost, we did it. Because we were only protecting the, the actual perimeter. So basically, they will get they will get a lot of uh, UDP floods or, or or TCP floods or even layer seven attacks. So basically, we we protect their their perimeter. They lost lost seven hundred and fifty BTC. Then we had the DAO, which I just talked about. It's uh, it's around uh, fifty million dollars in ether. Then we had a coin check hack in twenty eighteen for one hundred and thirty million. And then we have uh, some of the exchanges uh, that were compromised uh, around the world. Uh, $1.5 billion in losses, right? So here's a number that I want you to see before, uh, before I see, you see this number. It's uh, 20, 2019, you have compromises at Binance, Cryptopia, uh, DragonX, GateHub, BitDom, and CoinMana. And uh, here's a number that, that is very shocking. Around eighteen hundred dollars in average were stolen per minute in 2018. If that is not enough to drive a security um, industry within the blockchain, I don't know what else it is. All right? So that's that was the average eighteen hundred dollars per minute stolen in cryptocurrency. So before I I I, I switch it to to Victor, we, we, one of our messages is we had to come up with security standards. Openness and exposure does not mean security. The fact that you can see it and it's out there somehow, and I, I remember this from, from, the, from the beginning, from 2009, 2010, we, we, we believe that basically by having the ledger exposed and seeing what everybody was doing and then protecting the, the, um, the identities, by just looking at, at anonymized addresses, what's going to be enough? And the and the we had this 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 uh, this libertarian dream of uh, eliminating the fiat and self-regulating by basically being open and transparent. We now know that's not possible. I mean, if that number doesn't prove it, I don't know what else. Um, it's hard to balance at times, basically, the anonymity with uh, the the transaction levels. Uh, so at one point, there will be a regulation. And I know many people would not like to hear that, but yes, they will, they will have to come with standards and eventually regulation. Um, and then uh, sometimes when we put all our eggs right, into uh, one basket, like we just saw an example, a major exchange was attacked and breach. Right? They got in. Right? Hopefully nothing else happened. But my coins are there. Right, so I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh wait, my coins are there. If they got to my wallet, that's it, right? So when we put our stuff at one exchange, then this is sort of like a single point of attack. And um, uh, one of the, the points that Victor is gonna uh, touch on, how uh, these attacks uh, have affected uh, a majority 
of sites, including exchanges. And of course, the cryptocurrency, because of the, uh, the, the regulated environment and the level of anonymity is sought by organized crime and nation states. So I'm not sure if you heard about the whole wave of uh, ransomware that's happening, at least in Florida. I mean, one city is okay, two cities, three cities, four cities. I mean, at one point you had to wonder, are they targeting all the schools, all these uh, municipalities, low budget, outdated systems? And then where is the payment being sought? It's cryptocurrency. It's hard. Then they go and, and launder it. And uh, that's another point that he's going to touch on. Smart contracts with flaws are immutable. And once they're deployed in the blockchain, well, the immutability helps the exploitability. And that's one of the things that he's going to touch on today. So we again, before I, I, I uh, pass it to Victor, uh, we need to, to come up with, with some InfoSec standards, just like we apply. We have a PCI, we have SOX, and many of all these standards. A compliance is sometimes not worth much, but at least it's an attempt to get somewhere instead of just thinking, no, this, is, this by itself will regulate. Uh, so here's a, uh, uh, something that may happen to you. Right, so we have a so, some <laughs> some adult side that got spanked, um, and uh, I bring this up because they didn't audit the smart contract, and they lost almost forty thousand uh, dollars in one day. So with that, I'm gonna bring it to Victor. Thank you, thank you, and. Uh, yeah, right before this talk, I had a chance to talk to two very smart um, uh, gentlemen, also from San Francisco, Sammy and Phil. I asked them, have you heard about blockchain APD? I said, what? There's an APD on blockchain? I'm very proud to be here sharing something new today. So, and this is the original title was How to Pound Smart Contract and Make $4 million in Weeks. To give a feeling how much money is it? That's about $4 million. But that, we're not talking about cash, okay? We're talking about Ethereum. It's also like a silver of the cryptos, okay? And um, this is the latest like a MIT Tech Review article on blockchain security. The title is sort of sad, right? Once held as unhackable, blockchains are now getting hacked, right? And it's very proud that our company, HNI, was mentioned three times. And um, so APT, how many of you heard about APT? That's great, right place, guys. And just a little bit warning, I have some source code here and the, the slides. So for those of you who write smart contract or JavaScript, there's a puzzle there for you, okay? So what's APT, right? It's basically the worst nightmare of cybersecurity and the definition, stealthy and continuous computer hacking process orchestrated by person targeting a specific entities, okay? And I, I'm very proud to work as part of the team uh, that are Mandian, five Mandian, who are defining all these APT groups. And I will also contribute some of the research, how to use machine learning to actually detect those, uh, like PowerShell in the APT32. Okay, let's talk about the target, okay? Uh, how many of you heard about formal 3D? Okay, what does formal mean? Fear of missing out, exactly. So you guys are not missing out today. I'm gonna talk about something serious. This guy's $10 million worth of crypto assets sitting there. It's a website like this, it looks funny, but the money is real, okay? How do you play this? It's basically like a Ponzi scheme game, but people, <laughs> people just play it, okay? And the nice thing about it is, okay, this Ponzi scheme game is actually a piece of code executed on the blockchain. So there's no centralized governance and all that, okay? Everything is, is mandated by a piece of code, 2,000 lines only, okay? And how you play, right? So you buy the key, and by the way, there's a screenshot of how I participate in this. You buy a key there. So and the last guy who bought the key, when the clock hit zero, he will win the jackpot, which is usually a millions of dollars worth of Ethereum, okay? And the developers, right? The very smart developers at Foremost 3D, right? They actually, um, to increase the, um, interactivities, right? They add a little like a lottery mechanism. Whenever you, you participate, you buy a key, you have a small chance of winning a lottery, okay? Otherwise, this game, if you think about it, right? Just simulate it. When the clock goes to zero, what's gonna happen? Um, with, the clock, uh, with the clock almost hit zero, what's gonna happen? Yeah, exactly, right? So this game should never stop. 
right? Theoretically, <laughs> right? If it normal operates, right? But uh, well, it actually stopped. <laughs> so, uh, but that's not something we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about how the blockchain APT hacker group would identify actually how do they exploit that lottery bug. Okay, here's a piece of code. So, um, so actually, yeah, it's pretty hard to see. Um, so there's really like the first section of the code, okay, and it's actually a function called is human. What does that do? Why do you put is human function in a, a smart contract? Yeah, make sure it's a human interacting that. Unfortunately, it's written by human, a uh, bug. And then <laughs> that can lead to the second, which is that uh, airdrop, a random airdrop. And it says, um, do we have a winner in the comment? And what does that function do? Generating a random number, right? And that's the piece of code, and again, is all transparent. It's sitting there on the blockchain, right there. And how, how much time would it take to run all those whole bunch of addition hashes on your computer? Get take a guess. What? How many milliseconds? Usually like 15 milliseconds or so, right? But uh, for those of you, right, who are familiar with um, Exilium, right, how long does it take to set up a transaction? Usually like, 10 seconds and stuff like that. So keep that numbers in mind, okay? So if you, you are going to exploit stuff like this, what you can do, right? Yeah, hold it, I think you got the answer already. <laughs> but now, yeah, again, $10 million on these 2,000 lines of code. Okay, so based on our research, right, um, we actually kind of detected the lucky hackers, okay? They only contributed to like half of the, uh, only 10% of the transactions, okay? But this guy took half of the entire airdrop pool. Super lucky, right? <laughs> yeah, they should actually be here in casinos. And if you look deeper, right, into the exact transaction, that's another nice thing that uh, Rob mentioned about, right? All the transaction, no matter good or bad, right, is, in, you know, is recorded in the ledger on the public blockchain. And this is the exact transaction, and one of the many, right? And uh, yeah, I just look at, I mean, it's kind of, there's a lot of like sub function calls, smart contract calls and all that, but really, this function, right, it, it is, this transaction, we call it like 0 0.1 is in, and how much do they get out of it? 0 0.1 night, right? So they get, uh, they make 90% of ROI, okay? And this is, again, one of the many transactions they're doing, okay? And just to demystify, right? So actually, using our our engines and all that, right? So the target is on the top, okay? That ten million dollar asset sitting right there, big target. Everybody can see it. And the guy, there's a little guy down there. We call it the captain. And we're gonna showcase why we call it a captain. And then in the middle of them, right? There is about like uh, fifty thousand smart contract or addresses are interacting with that guy. Okay, just think, remember the code I just showed you. What's the problem with this? If you see a graph like that, what's the problem? Connected to the, the, the source code I just showed you. Remember the first function, right? Yeah, answer it. <laughs> All bots, yes. So that actually means that is human function was bypassed, totally. <laughs> and that's why this guy can launch a huge campaign of bots to actually interact with that. And each of them gonna win, okay? Because what this guy ended, ended up doing is they took that piece of code, right, that random number generator, it's transparent there, they simulated in their smart contract, and they only play with this poor little target up there when they are going to win when they know they're gonna win. That's why they're always hitting like 90% profits, right? And when we look at it like last August, right, this guy already made like $150,000 sitting there in the wallet. And uh, yeah, and uh, advanced persistence threat, right? In terms of advanced, what happened to this guy when they run the transaction? Self-destruct. <laughs> so, they don't leave any bytecode on the blockchain. <laughs> so, they, but the transaction will still be there. 
but the bicycle that they use to attack that smart contract is removed, self-destruct. And why is that? Why do you do that? You don't want to share your profit with some other hackers, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, so this is what led to the um, our our like uh, definition of blockchain APT, right? So it's basically a very similar tactics and all that, right? So very similar to what Mendian has been defining, right? The only difference is now this whole attack hacker groups are actually is running on a decentralized world, which is actually in our mind is actually harder to defend than even cloud security. This whole thing, you don't even know where, which miner, in which country is running that smart contract by call to verify and then reach the consensus. And to give you the full visual, right, this is all the millions of addresses being interacting with uh, that little guy sitting there, the $10 million target. And to prove that we actually know this, some of the address we have put, we highlighted some of the address, and this guy sitting in the middle, right, is the target and the captain and all that sitting there. That actually only converged to five addresses, wallets, the real wallets. But this guy launched hundreds of thousands of smart contracts to drain money from the pool. Is that the end? Of course not. We actually found there's a funny, very funny app in China that uh, is actually a copycat of Formos 3D. And it runs on Android, by the way. And see the pool they're showing is like, what, 100,000 Exilium? That's a lot of money. And this guy actually ranked the top five D app in the Exilium last summer. And this guy also has $9 million of jackpot pool, right? And um, yeah, when we look at it, right, it's actually like very similar byte codes. And including the bugs, they just copy everything. <laughs> from the form of reading. The, the only thing they probably change is the, the dividend. The, the, act, the account that received the dividends, the develop, developer's account, that's probably the only thing they change, right? You don't want to send money to the <laughs> form of 3D team. You want to take the money, right? But they just take everything because form of 3D is basically open source. It's on GitHub, right? And um, yeah, so it doesn't, the hackers never sleep, especially on the blockchain world. And uh, so the kill chain, let's talk, let's dig a little bit deeper into what's going on here, right? So to recap, I mean, some of you may already taking the Mendian training or whatever, APD training, right? This is the attack life cycle, right? Usually initial compromise, establish full hold and es uh, prevail with escalation, right? Internal recon, complete them, and then move laterally, right? And then maintain presence until they hit the jackpot complete the mission. And just to highlight a little bit, right, most of the APT, what's the goal of most of the APT attack? Is to make, yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> All hackers want to do that, but what exactly is that? What, what's the step be before that? Probably steal, steal data, right? Steal data, right? The breaches, that's like why these guys are so patient, right? The, the average, time that they can start they stay in the enterprise without detecting is like what 200 days yeah what's the latest number we have a Mendian guy on the <laughs> on the on your audience is that one 150 days now the rest during the days have you read the, the latest m chain report <laughs> okay, let me send a copy to you <laughs> so um, anyways so um, but uh, this blockchain abdq chain right is actually a very similar um kind of a kill chain, right? So similar steps. The only difference is the actual tactics, right? Now, again, right, you, you are not targeting an enterprise. You are not targeting a cloud security vendor, right? You are targeting something that is a clear target sitting there in the decentralized blockchain, right? So usually they do a recon using like Web3, the Web3 JS, right? To kind of scan what's going on there, right? And then when they found the vulnerability, right? This actually, we have the entire life cycle of that, those, that captains and those few accounts, right? So actually they're super hardworking. They actually have been doing like days and nights and trying to exploit that smart contract, right? And then when they found a bug, found a vulnerability, like that one, it's a random number generator problem, right? And then there's a is human function can be bypassed, right? When they figure out those, they start building weaponized smart contract that can interact with it, 
right? And then the actually like like that smart contract I sold you, that transaction actually did that transaction interact with ten other smart contracts, right? Like a vault and all that, right? And then they start provoke now pro, uh, provoking, right? What's what the interacting smart contract, right? And then they try to exploit those. It's actually quite easy to buy, find a vault, right? There's a vault taking money in, right? You, of course, you don't want to put your whole wallet or the D app smart contract storing that much money. You probably want to move money into the vault, right? And then, uh, yeah, and then when they found it, right, they're going to launch those uh, automatic bot armies, right, to, to kind of drain money in an automatic way, not like by a human running the script, right? And at the end, like we just showed you, this guy actually made $2 million from the Formos 3D. And then they make another $2 million from the copycat. And just keep going. This guy make a few million dollars from each of those uh, smart contracts. And, um, and that's actually the, they shows the persistencies of this APD hacker group, right? That smart contract launched in July last year, okay? And what's the first box about? The three red boxes there. What's the first box about? The recon, exactly. Yeah, he's he's really <laughs> he's listening. That's great. I should give you a sticker. <laughs> and uh, what's what happened in the middle? Yeah, he found it, man. He found it, and then now he weaponized all the bot armies and launched like a hundred thousand smart contract to actually hack it. And that's probably one of the reasons that why the entire Xenium was jammed. Okay, <laughs> this guy pay a lot of money, but they make a lot more po profit out of it. And at the end, why do they stop? Why do they stop at the end? What? Oh, cover that now. <laughs> because the money is gone, they drain it. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> right? And um, yeah, and uh, to kind of like, Summarize a little bit, right? So, yeah, I mean, really, this is a very tough game in the blockchain. Blockchain security is opening up a new dimension of complexity, right? So in our mind, right, three eternal themes for this uh, emerging blockchain security industry. First one is the transaction, right? How we dig into all this massive number of transactions? How do we identify those suspicious accounts? How do we find out the tactics? How do they attack the smart contract and all that, right? Based on the transaction sitting on the ledger. Another, uh, um, another angle is the code security, right? So you're putting that piece of smart contract, which is a piece of like a source code, like JavaScript, like kind of source code, right? It's Ethereum. And um, yeah, but that one is actually operating on a totally open and transparent platform, right? And if you have a vulnerability in that smart contract, I just told you what's the consequence, right? And each of those are representation of crypto assets. There are money in those, right? They are not like a, a dump of a database in the hospitals and all that, right? So those you're dealing with directly currencies, okay? And the next one is infrastructure security. The blockchain right now, like Bitcoin, how old is Bitcoin? How old? Ten years. Ten years, exactly. How old is Ethereum? Only four years, right? And like it takes the internet, right? About 10, 20 or 30 years to evolve, to, to get to that, the uh, maturity that we're seeing today. But again, right? You're still seeing this entire cybersecurity industry, right? So oh, the hacker never stopped innovating, right? And uh, so in terms of the blockchain, it infrastructure in Alma is still very early, right? So there's a lot of opportunities there that we can add, put our talents into this field, right? To make it grow and make it more secure. And um, yeah, some of our latest uh, research, right? We feel like uh, we need more transparency into all these different blockchain ecosystem. Now we have those Bitcoin, Ethereum, EOS, Tron, and all that, right? But like this research you just published in, uh, in Coindesk, right? Actually, half of the EOS accounts, right, are actually run, operated by bots. And they looks like this, okay? Is that, could that be a human? No, <laughs> right? And there's um, economics, like, uh, reasons behind those, right? And, um, yeah, so, I mean, we, um, we 
we are long, we are publishing a book, right? So we're in the process of talk uh, or publishing a book on the blockchain building blockchain apps. I'm um, contributing a chapter on smart contract security and best practice, right? So we are talking to the publisher house, right? To try, uh, we try to, we want to make this chapter at least this chapter free on our website. So um, yeah, so follow our Twitter. It's gonna go out this year, right? So uh, yeah, to get your free copy of the the the, the chapter, and uh, we're hiring. So. Yeah, that's the end of the show, and uh, questions? Yeah, go ahead. So wait, um, in the first book you were talking about, so how did they know when they won? And then were able to only send that written request? When do they know when they win? Other when they win? When they receive their money, they know it, they win. Oh, no, they Simple. <laughs> and it's money. <laughs> It's not a piece of data that you have to spend more effort on dark web to sell it. You are getting the crypto. Yeah, eh, go ahead. Yeah, so I had a question regarding the attack. Um, I'm guessing that the attack is not based on, it's based on the water in the park as well, right? And this is only one of them, yes. But there is another one targeting on the jackpot. That's another research. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, but this one we're talking about is... The only air drop, yeah, the lottery, exactly. The, is that the part of the game where it's like, so there's two parts of the game. The first part is that if you're the last person standing, you get the jackpot, but there's also this other lottery system where... It yeah, and this is the airdrop. The one we're talking about is the airdrop mechanism. Okay. So whenever you buy a ticket, you have a small chance. It's one of 1,000 or less than that, that you can win a small chance. A, a ch you win a proportion of that. Like this guy was making 90%, right, by various. So that's the vulnerability this hacker group exploited. Oh, I see. So the fact that he basically took random generated seed yes. and then calculated and made sure it was matching the same one as the same one. Exactly. And they, the right, right, isn't there a smart idea? They only play with the casino when they know they're going to win. Nice. Will you do that here? I <laughs> 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 think your last <laughs> loan, blame. <laughs> you just keep playing. Yeah, you may be breaklisted if you do it here. Yeah. <laughs> right, this is a quick one. So the seed that was part of that airdrop, yeah. was that something that was set by the XR contract Yes. Of it? It's right here. It's right here. That twenty, that fifteen lines of code, that defines exactly how you will win the lottery, <laughs> and that's why people love smart contract, because the house is open to you. It's transparent. All the policy, how they dispute their funds, is written in the smart contract. Isn't that amazing? It's totally transparent. Yeah, go ahead. It seems like this would have been easy to detect. Was nobody watching? Um, actually, yes, um, but we're the first one detecting those. So you see that timeline that we find out? We actually start watching them when they start ex experimenting. It took them actually two weeks to figure out that vulnerabilities, yeah. about two weeks. So, so it was noticed, why wasn't some action taken? Uh-huh, that's what you talk about. In Ethereum, it's, there's literally no way, I mean, it's very hard to change your bike call, right. unless you do those upgradables and whatever, those fancy Hard stuff. Work. But that's exactly why people trust Ethereum and those blockchain, because that piece of code is your promise to the public, right? All your logic is recorded there. You're not supposed to just change it, right? That's the immutability of the blockchain smart contract. Yeah, but then there's a, like, there's a new version of it. Try, you can actually upgrade the buy codes and all that, right? But actually, that bring in a new attack surface, if you think about it, right? There's pros and cons. And that's why we feel like this field is fascinating. <laughs> it's always evolving. Yeah. Yeah? Well, this is like a bigger problem in software engineering than mm. like, even off of the blockchain. The code we write every day is inherently vulnerable. Mm hmm It's a free, it's a free audit. You do, you do yeah, so actually, yeah, that's part of the mission we're doing. We have a free smart contract auditing sandbox out there in the, that all developers can just go and submit their code there, run it. We're going to scan for the about 30 vulnerability that's already known, right? But your question actually it touched a very um, 
good point of what's going on in this blockchain, emerging blockchain security, because literally, there's no standard, like you just mentioned, there's no standard. So right now, Enchain AI is actively participating in like OWASP. So we're adding, we're, we're helping the, com, uh, the, the community defining the blockchain um, standards and all that, right? I mean, and this is going to be a, a community effort, right? We love this technology. It's totally transparent. I, we feel like this is going to be the future of all the software that you're going to like, like public facing kind of software, right? You have to put your source code and all that in a decentralized and a totally trustable platform. But now we are suffering from those vulnerabilities. Some of them are in the source code they write, right? Because they, they don't have the right auditing to call code and like we have in this software industry, right? The other one is the infrastructure, right? It's super immature. Like one of the vulnerabilities we found last year in EOS blockchain was actually called the, the callback or the rollback vulnerability. That means if you know how the EOS super node are dealing with the transaction producing the blocks, you can actually exploit that to make sure your transaction won't be recorded in the blockchain. But they fix it in December. They're very quick. They fix it in two weeks. But I mean, that is kind of like a zero day for EOS blockchain, right? But um, yeah, it takes a community effort, right? And this is a very new field, right? It awaits a lot of uh, standard and bodies and all that. And the good news is, like, as you guys following, right? Like, JP Morgan Chase, right? They have those stable coins ro rolling out in February. Facebook Libra, they are launching a new blockchain, right? The Libra blockchain, right? So when these big guys from the internet industry or the banking, right, they come in, they're going to help this uh, industry grow. But right now, it's, like, still very premature. That's a, that means a lot of opportunities, Right? Yeah. So, very quick point for you. There are companies that will do things like OCAM to rectify code compilers if you want to do that. There's mm -hmm. much more than one to go. Um, yeah. Question for you. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned JPMC, you mentioned um, Facebook, Libra, whatever. Um, one of the common features with them and everybody else running things that are not bullshit Ponzi scheme games uh, on the internet is that they have trust structures, governance, and off chain components. So, what are you seeing in Leaping out to old-fashioned governance, key shares, and backroom boards versus actually trying to solve this problem properly. Like so, yeah, so the really like yeah, so his question is about like what do we think about this like the emerging of enterprise blockchain, right? Like the stuff I just talked about, JP Morgan Chase and Fidelities and like Facebook, right? They are launching their chain. Those blockchain is probably falling to the private blockchain or the consortium blockchain. It's not like totally open to everybody. Like the JP Morgan Chase blockchain, they're only open to the banks that interact with the inside the JP Morgan Chase banking ecosystem, right? So that's actually, if you think about it, isn't that like the intranet? Yes. Isn't that in 2000, right? Isn't that? But that's just our take, right? I mean, with that consortium blockchain, yeah, definitely it's more secure because you have a much smaller risk exposure than the stuff we're talking about here, yeah, right? But I mean, I feel like, yeah, I mean, eventually this should be an open system, right? So that's our take. Like, think about the intranet and internet, right? At the end, no, nobody's using intranet, right? Maybe only a few of you may remember the term, if you are as old as me, but uh, yeah, that's what we believe. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.